Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Tarika Lee, a writer, journalist, filmmaker, and the author of a new book, The Duel, Pakistan and the Flight Path of American Power. Tariq, welcome back to Berkeley. Very good to be with you again, Harry. Why did you write the book? I wrote the book because uh, my publisher at Scribner said that U.S. citizens know very little about Pakistan, so it is your duty to write a book which at least tells them a bit. And then, as while I was writing it, the situation was getting more and more tense, so I thought Americans better know something about a country if they're preparing to invade it. Mm -hmm. And you call... Uh Pakistan a dysfunctional state. And you trace in this uh, uh, great book uh, the history of its birth. And I want to walk you uh, through your analysis of why it's a dysfunctional state. And, and let's start in a way with the beginning. Uh, tell us a little about how Pakistan came into being and, and uh, on the Pakistani side or the future leader side, it was in a way unexpected that the British would create a Muslim state. It was unexpected that this would happen. But increasingly in India, uh, you had a sprinkling of well-educated uh, Muslim layers who felt that they needed their own state. You know, Harry, some did it because they wanted to use it as a bargaining counter, a chip with which they could negotiate with the Indian Congress. Others were more serious. In any case, what really happened was that the party which created Pakistan, the Muslim League, backed the British during the Second World War. And the Congress party didn't. Gandhi, uh, in fact, chose that particular moment the Second World War to demand that the British quit India and launched a whole quit India movement in 1942, just after the fall of Singapore. Uh, and so the Muslim League, uh, you know, played with, with the British, were very close to it, collaborated with it. And Pakistan, I've argued, was a thank you present. Thank you've been good with us. We'll be good with you. We'll give you a state. Now, had the Congress supported the war effort as well and backed the British during the Second World War, it's an interesting counterfactual, what would have come into uh, uh, being. But in any case, that's what happened. So Pakistan was formed. But from the very beginning, you had a structural contradiction in the creation of this state that the basis of it was the Muslim majority areas of India. So that you got what is now Pakistan, but you also had East Pakistan, mm -hmm. half of Bengal. East Bengal was Muslim majority. So Bengal was divided and East Bengal became East Pakistan. No links with the West except uh, religion. West Pakistan. Yeah, with yeah. West Pakistan, Pakistan. except religion, divided from West Pakistan by a thousand miles of Indian territory, different language, different culture, even a different take on Islam itself. So this didn't last too long. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in 1972, for reasons I describe in my book in great detail, that state broke up. And ever since the breakup of that state, there's been a problem in what has been left in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. and, and we should point out to our American audience that the, we, we're talking a, a thousand miles separating <coughs> East from West Pakistan. Yeah. yeah. Now, the British, you make a, an interesting point that I want to mention, which is that, that both in the case of uh, Israel and in the case of Pakistan, the, we wound up with, with uh, uh, states with a religious identity, which has come to haunt us in both cases. 
It's absolutely true. It's it's religious identity and the equation of religious belief with ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, the leaders who led these struggles to create these countries were themselves not religious at all. Mm -hmm. We know that virtually the entire leadership of Israel uh, were either atheists or agnostics. They certainly weren't Orthodox Jews uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And in the case of Pakistan, those many Muslim League leaders paid lip service to the religion Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founding father, <coughs> excuse me, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founding father, according to many uh, reports, was not even a believer. So it was an attempt to utilize the fact that the religion was under threat or siege, whichever way you want to look at it, and carve out a state. Mm -hmm. And one of Pakistan's worst military dictators, General Zia ul Haq, used to compare. When I first made the comparison with Israel, mm -hmm. people were really shocked, anger, oh, why did you? Mm -hmm. Then General Zia made the analogy, said Pakistan is like Israel. Mm -hmm. a religious state uh, and uh, he wanted to be for, like Israel. And, and I, I guess the, the, uh, if we look at this in the broad sweep of history, what happens over time is in both cases uh, the threat to the regime becomes comes from the fundamentalist communities that in some cases, w well I guess in both cases were partly nurtured by the regime. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in Israel, it's the settlers mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, who were completely nurtured by the regime. Special apartments, special blocks were built for them. They're provided with security, uh, and now they're turning on it. And in Pakistan, of course, we know the history full well. It wasn't just the Pakistanis who nurtured religious fundamentalism as we know it now. I don't talk about moderate religious parties. Uh, it was done by the Pakistani dictator, totally backed by the West. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many of your listeners will know, Harry, that all the early jihadi manuals and books which are taught in the religious schools were actually printed courtesy of the University of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and th this is the period in which uh, the, the Soviet Union uh, invaded uh, 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 Afghanistan and uh, the the Reagan administration, uh, well, actually goes Carter. back to the Car Carter, right? No, no, In no. Other it words, wasn't Reagan. Yeah. It was Carter the, and Brzezinski. Yeah, right. Who 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 essentially began supporting uh, 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 the Muslim groups within Afghanistan uh, when a socialist leader came into uh, power. The Soviets were drawn, baited, and drawn in because Brzezinski wanted to create uh, a Soviet Vietnam, essentially. Yeah. And then when Reagan comes. In, he, the, carries the, the, uh, he carries on. He carries on. He carries on. And that's where we get the these manuals uh, that we're and and this. Uh, 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 I want to get to the U.S. in a moment, but but I think it's very important in understanding Pakistan. I, what what never was achieved was a national identity, and I think you're arguing that was the case because the the if the if, if, maybe the country shouldn't exist, but if it does exist, it really has has to be based on the, the ethnic identities of the different areas. Well, you know, this is a problem with Pakistan, um, that it was always a state, never a nation. Mm -hmm. And the interesting question is that India, Pakistan's giant neighbor from which it was carved out, never had that problem, mm -hmm. that you have many different nationalities 36 different languages spoken in India, if not more. But yet if you ask many Indians what their nationality is, they say Indian. Uh, they say I'm from South India or North India, but they're Indians. Pakistan never quite succeeded in doing that. Um, and one reason was that it was, uh, you know, it was cursed with an incredibly corrupt and greedy elite, mm -hmm. uh, largely composed of visionless people who were ba basically into making money. Initially, small amounts of money, but as years went on, large amounts of money. And so politics became in enmeshed with building personal fortunes, which mm. is a big, was a big tragedy for the mm. country. Um, 
And secondly, the Pakistani elite never permitted serious land reforms. Mm -hmm. The Indians pushed through land reforms, ended the power of big landlords. Pakistan never did that. So there was always a feeling of ambiguity towards the country and its apparatus from lots of ordinary people in all the different parts of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And after the breakup of Pakistan, well, the basic idea on which it had been built of uniting the Muslims of the Indian subcontinent no longer existed. Mm -hmm. It was dead and gone and buried. So what was the new state going to be? That mm -hmm. was the big question. Mm -hmm. And Benazir Bhutto's father, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, did dream about making it a modern social democratic state, but he could never deliver that. And then he was dumped on Kissinger's orders and uh, we had the worst military dictatorship in our history, which further weakened uh, the state and its hold over the population. So, so in this, w with this lack of a national identity, uh, the, 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 there was a, a constant search in a way for a substitute. And after the, the breakup of uh, the separation of East Pakistan from West Pakistan, uh, uh, anti-Hindu, uh, anti-India, focus on the threat uh, uh, from India became very important. Uh, and uh, what Pakistan fell into was a series of military regimes so that whose main support group was the military. And, and so th these two things came together to form a, a, uh, a substitute identity for Pakistan. This is absolutely true. And then when Pakistan finally obtained nuclear weapons, mm. that became a central feature. We are the only nuclear st Muslim state which has nuclear weapons. And that gave it a sort of a sort of spooky identity, but mm. nonetheless a strong identity. Mm. And it's, but that identity created by sh a show of military strength is always superficial, really. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go deep enough. I mean, you have very real problems in this uh, country, Harry. Poverty, mm -hmm. large-scale illiteracy, uh, no education system, no health service uh, worth talking about. I mean, the figure I give in my book you know, f normally I can say that very little shocks me when mm -hmm. I read stuff or go to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I'm prepared for everything. One thing did shock me. It's the figure provided by the UNDP report, the United Nations Development Report, which said that 60% of children born in Pakistan are born stunted. 60%. Yeah. In other words, the height of the average Pakistani is going down. Mm -hmm. And this is, to me, just so deeply shocking and mm -hmm. such a commentary on the corruptions of the military political elite that has run this country, mm -hmm. that they don't care about it. This is happening under their eyes. They mm -hmm. just don't do anything. And, and as you said, land reform never occurred. You, you say in the book, large landowners own 40% of the land and control the irrigation. Uh, and uh, uh, some 56 million Pakistanis, nearly 30% of the population now live under the poverty line. And it, it, it didn't get any better under Musharraf. No. Yeah. It didn't get any better under Musharraf because Musharraf and his gang were living under the illusion that we could all now be like the United States mm -hmm. and that as long as the fat cats in Pakistan grew rich, as long as Porsche opened a new garage, this was signs of modernity. Mm -hmm. You know, these people who grew rich lived in a bubble mm -hmm. uh, and they were quite happy living in that a bubble. Musharraf's first Prime Minister, Shokat Aziz, was a Citibank employee. Quite wealthy. Let's not say anything beyond that, but quite wealthy. Mm -hmm. And he was trusted by the United States to be in there and trusted by the Musharraf regime because of his contacts with the United States. But these people never did anything for the poor of the country or never even tried to do 
elementary things, Harry, like giving us the country an education system. Mm -hmm. People say, why all these religious schools, madrasas? Good question. But you know, if a, a, a cleric, a mullah comes to your house, you're a poor guy, either unemployed or a peasant, or a part-time worker, you have six kids. Let's leave aside the question of why you have six kids, maybe you shouldn't, but you do. And the mullah, the cleric says to you, give me one of your sons. We'll look after him, we'll educate him, we'll clothe him, we'll feed him, and he'll grow up to be a fine man. The Jesuits used to say this, give us someone at seven and we'll show you the future. And the mullah say, what they don't tell the parents is, we might train him to be a jihadi. They don't. Mm. Naturally, they don't. But families are so desperate for their kids to be educated, they say, fine, go. At least you're getting something. Why hasn't the Pakistani state, from 1947 till 2008 when we're talking, succeeded in building an education system which can educate the entire people. It's got nothing to do with Islam. Malaysia, a large, large-ish Muslim state, has managed to educate its citizens, give them the ability to learn English as a second language. 90% of Malays speak English. And Dr. Mahathir, when I asked him once, he said, we did this 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, precisely because we didn't want our poor people to suffer from not speaking English, why shouldn't they have access to all the books and technology and go for further education? In Pakistan, this didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen, because the elite guards its privileges very strongly, and that is a big tragedy. And it's a tragedy no one cares about. People talk about war, occupation, military. Fine, we have to discuss those things. But what I'm describing to you is the real tragedy of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. and, and what is remarkable in, in your account as you, you uh, record Pakistan's uh, modern history, uh, uh, is the extent to which what you're saying is true, whether it's civilian leaders or military. So what you have is civilian leaders, military leaders, and civilian leaders. And uh, at the core, and, and so we look at somebody like uh, uh, Benazir Bhutto's father, who essentially is the one who starts the nuclear program. Uh, 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 Benazir Bhutto comes in, there's really no change. Uh, and in fact, her, her husband, uh, uh, the, the current president now, uh, was uh, apparently on the take, uh, Mr. Ten uh, Percent, I guess they called him. So, so this, this corruption continues over time. Uh, and you don't get the organization of meaningful political parties. Talk about that, because when, when democracy returns, which uh, apparently is important for the United States, uh, it, it, it doesn't take hold and change things in the way you're talking about. No, and I remember discussing this with Benazir Bhutto many, many years ago, and she said the world has changed. People like you won't accept it. Mm -hmm. And now it's all about money. Politics mm -hmm. is all about money. And there was, of course, a strong element of truth in this, Harry, because it, uh, you know, the fact that you have center left and center right parties with no basic differences between them on the big issues of the day is a universal phenomenon. In Pakistan, it worked out especially badly because the needs of the population were very large, very great. And one reason why we never developed a proper political party, I think, is that military dictatorships disrupted the organic flow and development of mm. politics. You, a country needs 50 to 60 years to do that. And in Pakistan, this was never permitted. So you had the party that created the country degenerating into a clutch of quarrelsome gangs fighting each other, desperate for power, desperate for the accoutrements of power, flying the flag on their cars, being saluted, getting into entry. 
into the VIP lounges or the VVIP lounges. I mean, that is what characterizes most of these people, a desire to be be on, on, the, on top. Bhutto, Benazir's father, could have created a party which was different, and initially, to be fair, he did try to. His party grew out of the radical movement of 1968, which toppled the Ayub dictatorship. But soon Bhutto, as he settled down to power, mm -hmm. wouldn't tolerate dissent within his own party. And once you don't tolerate dissent within your own party, it becomes difficult to tolerate dissent within the country at large. Mm -hmm. That is what we see in many different parts of the world. And his rule did become more and more authoritarian, and he basically laid the basis for a military takeover. You see, the question I always ask is when he was hanged, nobody came out onto the streets. Mm -hmm. Very revealing. And even the dictator who hanged him was amazed because they'd made all the preparations. Mm -hmm. I think there are two reasons for that. One mm. is that people were scared. No doubt about it. They were scared and they thought, why should we give up our lives for him? when ultimately our conditions haven't improved that much. Mm -hmm. It was as straightforward as that. So we've had this network of dictators and political elites till now, as you, as you say, it's reached a tragedy. Uh, it would be a comic tragedy were it not so serious that Benazir Bhutto, in her will and testament, if she wrote it in some doubt, but who knows, her official will and testament bequeaths her political party to her mm. family as if it were an heirloom, a piece of jewelry from Tiffany's. Here it is. My son will be president for life of this party. This is a kid who's 18, 19 years old. Till he comes of age, his father, my husband, will run the party. And all these functionaries of this political organization bow and, you know, touch their forelocks and say, fine, fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a real joke, really. And Zardari, her husband, is elected indirectly as president of the country, not directly. And as you said, he's known for being corrupt. There's no doubt about that. But he's also charged with murder, which a case never came to trial accused of killing his brother-in-law, Benazir Bhutto's brother. This is the guy who is currently running the country, and he's as sleazy as anything. Mm -hmm. You can even see it when he sort of makes sort of slightly off-color jokes with Sarah Palin. You can just see what sort of guy he is. And it's Pakistan's tragedy that having got rid of a military dictator, this is a civilian president they've been lumbered with. Mm -hmm. Bhutto's <laughs> father was killed by <coughs> General Zia. And General Zia uh, did two things. He embraced Islam uh, in an extraordinary way. And, and uh, unfortunately, in this recent American movie, Charlie Wilson's War, I don't know if you saw it, he was, he was kind of made a into a nice guy, basically. Uh, but he, he also became a key agent in the funding of the Mujahideen by the United States as part of this, this dealing with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that we were talking about. Uh, uh, talk a little about that, uh, because I think it, it becomes very important, because this leads us into the, the, the second part of your book, which is a theme that goes throughout the whole book, namely the role that the United States plays in this vacuum, because it's the relationship with the United States that, that funds and fuels, uh, especially the military, uh, as it becomes a continuing presence in the leadership group. Well, uh, the period of dictatorship under General Zia al-Haq, which lasted from 1977 to 88, was the worst period in our country's history. The previous dictator, Ayub, wasn't great. Nature had not endowed him with a great intellect, but he wasn't uh, a bigot. Uh, he, he was sort of fairly easygoing uh, general. General Zia ul Haq is trained at Fort Bragg, trained in counterinsurgency. 
as a young officer. One of his first tasks is he is seconded to the Jordanian army as a brigadier to help wipe out the Palestinians in Black September. That should have alerted Bhutto, who had him leap over five more senior generals and become commander-in-chief of the Pakistan army. In any case, because he was a Uriah Heap figure constantly playing the clown in front of Bhutto, yes sir, no sir, whatever you want sir, uh, he was promoted. And he did the US's bidding. There is no doubt that if the US had instructed him not to hang Bhutto, he would have spared him. But he, the, the Bhutto's execution was green-lighted because he'd lied to the US and told them he wasn't making a bomb when he was. I mean, that's the real reason, and everyone knows it. So Bhutto is hanged, and he is hanged three months before, no, not three months before, about six to seven months before the Russians enter Afghanistan. It's the Russian entry, Soviet Red Army troops entering Afghanistan which transforms Zia's standing in the world. Uh, and he becomes irreplaceable. He becomes a very crucial player for the United States. And he says he's going to, he's a soldier of Islam. And this war can only be fought by uh, hardcore religious elements against the Russians who feel that atheists and unbelievers have taken over the country. And so he's given all sorts of backing. You know, Charlie Wilson's War is a joke movie based on fantasy. The war was decided during the Carter regime. If anyone's, if it was anyone's war, we would have to call it Brzezinski's War. He was the mastermind behind it, and he had a clear plan, as we discussed earlier. He wanted the Russians to feel the pain the U.S. had felt in Vietnam at being defeated. And from that point of view, uh, Brzezinski uh, triumphed. Uh, but the cost of that was the creation backed by the, by the Pakistani state and funded by the US of large numbers of jihadi groups. Mm -hmm. People were brought in from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, we know that. And that is still now haunting the country. So once you sow dragon seeds, then you have to be prepared for the results. And we are now witnessing the results today. And history doesn't go away, Harry. You know, things you've done 20 years ago will stay there mm -hmm. to haunt you, mm -hmm. which is why it's worth discussing when we come to it. What the U.S. is about to do now in Pakistan seems to many of its people possibly normal, but it'll come back to haunt them, mm -hmm. not before too long. And, and just for a minute, staying with the Zia period, th th this goes then back to your earlier reference to the manuals that the jihadists uh, were using were, were written in, in the United States <coughs> because we were training uh, this, this first generation of terrorists uh, uh, and hoping that they would use what they learned against the Soviets with no future uh, orientation to see that at some yeah, point they might turn was, on us. It was short-sighted, but mm. served the needs of the U.S. at the time. This is what imperial powers often do, that yeah. their short-term interests often override long-term strategic uh, thinking. Uh, and that is what they did in the case of Afghanistan. And they defeated the Russians, but they paid a heavy price for it. Mm -hmm. And they gave Pakistan its only victory ever when Benazir and the military sent in the Taliban to take Kabul. Mm -hmm. uh, it was under her watch that the Taliban takeover of Kabul was completed. It was essentially a military operation. But that is uh, the period when it was uh, put into place, a direct outcome of what had uh, happened before. And it's not that they didn't know. Even in the 50s during the Cold War, if you look at textbooks written for U.S. universities at the time, they were saying that good people in these countries, whether it was Indonesia or Pakistan or the Arab world, where the enemy was, were religious groups. 
the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the Jamaat Islami in Pakistan, and the Jamia Islami in Indonesia were groups the U.S. worked with against the communists in these countries. Mm -hmm. So it was one step more from there to start creating new groups uh, which were more violent, which could be trained, and which would do the U.S.'s bidding. Mm -hmm. But once you stopped funding and arming them, they became free agents. Uh, and the last time it has to be said that Al-Qaeda in particular, or people close to it were used, was in Bosnia as mm. late as the 90s. It's a very, you know, uh, Lawrence Wright's book, The Looming Tower, The History of Al-Qaeda. It's a very interesting book with lots of good stuff in it. But there is virtually nothing mm. on the last joint U.S. Al-Qaeda operation, which is in Bosnia. And I always wondered why, especially as he writes, some of the most interesting information we got was from an Al-Qaeda guy's computer in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. Well, so he knows they were there. So why not cover this in detail? So it's not even as late as the 80s. It's as late as the mid 90s that the last joint operations took place. Mm -hmm. and, and we should explain to our audience that uh, Bhutto, uh, Benazir Bhutto support. This is after the Soviet Union uh, left. Uh, left. There's a civil war in uh, in uh, Afghanistan, uh, and the Taliban, which I think means students. students. Yeah. So, so it, it actually uh, the take, yes, it, it takes us back to what you were saying earlier, namely that uh, that uh, the poor parent would send their child because the state wasn't providing. Uh, uh, the, the social welfare that one would expect from a state, but the Pakistani state didn't care about <coughs> delivering it. No, they yeah. didn't. And these were the kids who finally, as they grew up, were trained, uh, linked to jihadi fighters who had fought the Russians, given logistic support and weaponry by the Pakistani military, and no doubt large numbers of uh, Pakistani soldiers in civilian clothes joined them, and they took Kabul. Mm -hmm. This was the only victory the Pakistan army has ever won in its entire existence, and it immediately began to boast of having obtained a strategic depth vis-a-vis -vis India, which mm -hmm. was foolish. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I think that before we get into a discussion of the U.S., which is kind of a lurking presence here, we, we do have to uh, talk a little about how uh, Zia and Bhutto saw these fundamentalists, because we, we have, you have a religious state, the fundamentalists are an instrument. So their, their uh, Pakistan's strategic goals uh, were regional ones and and could be can be separated from the U.S. interest. And here, the, as you just said, the focus is on the strategic threat uh, that uh, uh, exists from India. So uh, and, and and a Taliban in Afghanistan gives Pakistan strategic depth uh, as it focuses on India. Yeah, that is the military thinking. Yeah. But as Whether you know, it's correct or not, I'd say, yeah. Yeah, that, is, that was certainly yeah. the thinking behind the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, uh, and which is why the Pakistani military backed it. But then, that was their only victory, as I've said, but it's a victory they had to unravel very rapidly after 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one, one point I want to make about the military or ha asked you about is when, when you talk about military rule, when you get this infusion of American, mil American aid after 9-11, uh, uh, the military is the primary beneficiary, not so much the, the, the Pakistan economy, but the, the t t talk, play that out because we, I think it's, it's important to understand the, uh, how the military, with its political power, uses that to benefit the military and not just for more weapons. It's businesses too, right? It's businesses too, and the military owns lots of businesses, yeah. by the way, as armies do these mm -hmm. days all over the world. And so the $10 billion is used, you know, essentially to bring the military up to scratch on its uh, 
competition with India. So they buy a lot of weapons, largely from the United States. So a lot of that 10 billion goes back to the United States in weapons purchases. Mm -hmm. This is how the military industrial complex works, as you know, um, and is kept happy. Uh, so th that, that happens. Very little of the money trickles down to any useful projects. It's essentially shoring up the military-industrial complex of Pakistan by the military-industrial complex of the United States. That's what the money is used for. They get more aircraft fighters. They have, I think, bought some anti-aircraft weapons from the Russians, but apart from that, because the Russians have state-of-the-art stuff on this. But apart from that, it's largely from the United States. And I have no doubt they've also used that money to um, shore up security on the nuclear facility and all that. I do, But that's where the money goes. Yeah, it's military to military. Mm -hmm. So uh, throughout this history that we're talking about, I guess beginning in 1950, because in the beginning you, you're saying that the U.S. was reluctant to give uh, a military aid, but then as the Cold War heated up, it, it it has been so it, it's been uh, a, a lurking presence throughout this history but so but it, it really becomes uh, even uh, more extreme after 9-11 and I want to talk about that because uh, the apparent victory of US forces in Afghanistan after 9-11 can be read many different ways and then then what we're going through right now follows from that so talk a little about that namely Armitage comes to Musharraf uh, uh, delivers an ultimatum and, and then what followed from that well uh, the Armitage ultimatum is very straightforward it's delivered to the head of the Pakistani intelligence services who happens to be in Washington lunching with congressmen mm -hmm. the day or breakfasting with congressmen sorry uh, the day on that day on 9 11 mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly the twin towers is up in flames so there's naturally a major crisis and even after that the head of the isi tells them that you know we can rely on mullah omar in afghanistan he's not a bad guy as you think well naturally there's slight consternation at this remark in the United States, but they send an ultimatum through him, explaining what facilities they want, and Musharraf grants them. He agrees, there's a discussion in the military, and they say we can't resist them. And I think one factor, well, not often talked about, but known, is that if Pakistan had refused to offer its military bases and its airspace to the United States, India was ready to do that mm. and Pakistan knew that so they thought <coughs> that would be a tragic for us if we allowed India to do it so let the United States uh, use our airspace again they've been out of the country for some time we get them back money will flow and they did it but the result of that was that the Pakistani military also told the Taliban not to fight back and a bulk of them didn't Kabul fell without a struggle, mm -hmm. which would never have happened had Pakistan not been on site. Uh, if you remember in Iraq, the resistance to the occupation began very rapidly, taking US policymakers totally by surprise, foolishly so. In Afghanistan, there wasn't one. It grew more traditionally, more slowly, and is now reaching a frenzy as we speak. But in the early days, the Pakistani role was very crucial in enabling the United States to occupy and take Afghanistan. Now, and, and was Pakistan was uh, uh, instrumental in opening the borders, if, if they had power to close them, I don't know, to both Taliban and Al Qaeda, and they they went to the Northwest Territories. Is that uh, is that the way they implemented what you just described? Well, uh, they told the Taliban that, of course, they were free to return mm -hmm. <coughs> and come back, and a lot of people did at that time. Uh, whether they had any direct contact with Al Qaeda has to be proved, but they probably did mm -hmm. and made. Whether the, this off, we know it was made to the Taliban. Uh, Mullah Omar didn't come back at that time. He disappeared into the mountains. 
uh, where Al-Qaeda, when they decided uh, to move into the tribal areas, if they are there, we don't know too much on this, it's very murky, uh, then they could have done it with or without the approval of the Pakistan army. They wouldn't have needed that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you, you point out that uh, I think it's important for uh, our audience to understand the, the border provinces, and you make an interesting point that the, the Northwest uh, Territories is a province named by its geographical location, yeah. so, that, so that it has never really been successfully integrated, uh, assuming that Pakistan has done that elsewhere, which may not be the case, but, but it, it's kind of remained autonomous, uh, it has its own security forces, and it has tribal leadership, basically. Well, now, what you're talking about is the tribal areas. Yeah, the tribal areas. The federally administered tribal mm -hmm. areas, <coughs> which represent the border, well, the borderlands between Afghanistan and Pakistan. But then you also have a Northwest Frontier province, mm -hmm. which is not called Pashtunistan, as Punjab, Sindh, Balochistan, named after ethnicities. The Northwest Frontier Province is not called Pashtunistan because, of course, the British created a border dividing Pasht the Pashtuns from each other in 1891 mm -hmm. during one of the Afghan wars. And so the Durand Line, which is the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, which Afghanistan has never recognized, divided the Pashtuns. And people didn't like it, but the British and the Pakistani governments that followed never implemented this border that closely. I mean, the, the restrictions. So if you were a Pashtun dressed in local clothes, you could go travel across, come in and out without showing a passport. Many, most people didn't have passports. So it was quite loosely applied. And I think in the United States, it's important to stress this, that there are relationships, mm -hmm. there are tribal relationships, family relationships on both sides, that the Pashtun people know each other, respect each other, and that what is going on now is not just religious, it is also an element of it could be described as Pashtun nationalism against an occupation. And with this spilling over into Pakistan, of course, the situation becomes dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to deal with the deteriorating situation uh, now, uh, there is a, going to be, and both candidates for the American presidency agreed on, a, a larger contingent <coughs> of American uh, forces. And this is uh, tied in with a strategy for the West and for NATO. And, and I think one of the really interesting points in your book is seeing the larger picture here, uh, uh, the, the, the long-term goals here on the one hand, but how they interface with the Pakistan that you've just described. So let, let's talk about that. What is the U.S. and NATO up to uh, in the new phase of the <coughs> war that's supported by both presidential candidates in the United States? Well, uh, on the face of it, it would seem that the aim of the operation in Afghanistan is limited to wiping out terrorism. But this can mean lots of different things. In fact, we know that both the United States and the British are often talking to Taliban leaders or spokespeople behind the scenes because they want to incorporate them in running the country. They know they can't do it with Hamid Karzai, who's a corrupt uh, figure incapable of uniting the country, totally dependent on foreign uh, uh, troops to protect and guard him. I mean, corruption in Afghanistan is endemic, and the West knows that. All the intelligence reports coming out of Afghanistan are a bit like that, Harry. I mean, the tenor of these intelligence reports said, hey guys, Afghanistan is like the Titanic. We've hit the glacier, but news hasn't spread. Mm -hmm. But you should be in no doubt as to what's going on. So the U.S. is keen to incorporate the neo-Taliban, as the British call it, into the running of Afghanistan. And for that, they'll need Pakistani help. But that is only if you understand what the long-term U.S. strategy is. 
uh, Joop Scheffer, the Dutchman who heads NATO, said so to the Brookings Institution at a talk he gave in early 2008, when asked by fairly well-informed people, what are we doing in Afghanistan? He said it's not to do with good governance and it's only partially to do with terror. The main aim is strategic, to build bases in a country that borders China and Iran and Central Asia. It's too good to give up and so this is what we're doing here, which explains, I suppose, the ease with which uh, Barack Obama uh, accepted all this as something necessary for U.S. strategic interests and he and McCain are both demanding that more troops be sent there. But there's a problem and the problem is that the people of that region don't want it. The New America Foundation conducted an opinion poll in Pakistan you know, a year ago, I think, or less than a year ago, 70% or almost 70% said that the biggest danger to the region, the biggest threat to peace came from the United States. A very large proportion, 70 or 80% said they were in favor of negotiating with all the terrorist groups and reaching some agreement. That is the feeling also in Afghanistan. Now, given this, how in God's name is the United States going to keep bases in perpetuity in Afghanistan to try and surround China? Look what happened when they tried to do it to Russia. Ultimately, the Russians struck in Georgia. I mean, it's nonsense to say it's got anything to do with democracy. It's a straight geopolitical thrust by the Russians and a warning, a shot across the uh, Washington bow saying, you do it in, in uh, Yugo the former Yugoslavia, we can do it too. Two can play that game mm -hmm. and don't come turn all hypocritical on us. They can do it, the Chinese can too. Since this, these announcements were made in Afghanistan of basis in perpetuity, for the first time ever, the Chinese and the Russians have engaged in joint military maneuvers in that region. So one, because the Chinese are very quiet, don't talk much about foreign policy, it shouldn't be imagined that they aren't watching the scene very closely indeed. And there, while the US lobby is the strongest lobby in Pakistan, the Chinese lobby is also quite strong inside the military. Mm -hmm. So, so what uh, I, I think you suggest in the book that one consequence of uh, uh, of uh, America and NATO building up its intervention forces, and and actually I think you make a comparison with the Vietnam War and and going across the borders uh, uh, to Pakistan to to pursue. Uh, I'm sorry, not going across the border to to Cambodia to pursue that conflict. You know. Uh, uh, back in the in the 60s and early 70s, uh, uh, what what do you see as the consequences? Will it create greater support for the Taliban, the very uh, uh, the very people that that we are opposing? And then, what will it do to whether Pakistan can hold together? Well, it is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. <coughs> General Petraeus has warned, and the this month, and we're in September 2008, that if Pakistan, more or less he said, if Pakistan doesn't behave itself, its own future is at stake. Mm -hmm. Quite an ominous warning, Harry. And of course, if the US decide to enter Pakistani territory, violating its sovereignty, in total breach of the UN Charter, and the Pakistanis military has warned them not to do so. Why? They are allies. <coughs> the reason is that the Pakistani military know full well that if there are incursions, not just by drones and missiles, but by US troops and special ops missions and Navy SEALs into that region, unless they are resisted and fought back, the very unity of the army is at stake. Mm -hmm. And that is why lots of serious people in the US establishment, General Zinni, Richard Armitage himself, warned earlier this year, don't do it. It's foolish to do that. But I think the pressure from the generals on the ground in Afghanistan, losing a war, it's a war they can't win, 
So they are saying the reason we can't win it is because these guys have sanctuary inside Pakistan. That's the analogy. The reason we can't win the war in Vietnam is because these guys have sanctuary inside Cambo Cambodia. So Kissinger and Nixon go to Cambodia and bomb the hell out of it with the results that we all know. Now, if that is done in Pakistan, it is going to create a virtual civil war situation. Either the army fights back. If the army doesn't fight back, it will see divisions and splits within its ranks. Uh, and lots will f go and fight in civilian clothes. I, I don't say this lightly. I think this could happen. So what is the point of destabilizing a country with nuclear weapons in this particular way? There is no danger of jihadis coming even close to these weapons. The military is strong. But if you break up the military or behave in a way to encourage that military to split, then all bets are off. And you know there are analysts in Pakistan, semi-official analysts, who are saying that the whole function of this is not because they think the Taliban or the neo-Taliban guerrillas are finding sanctuary, but to destabilize Pakistan and to defang, take our nuclear fangs out, uh, because uh, this is demanded by the friends of the United States. Now, were that to happen, and if the Pakistani military allowed that to happen, it's difficult to see the country uh, staying together. Mm -hmm. There would be big, big problems. So it's, we're, to we're, we're talking very serious business here, Harry, which mm -hmm. is why there was a big divide in the US establishment on this. Mm -hmm. And for Obama, one of his advisors is Brzezinski who knows better than most how unstable that world is, how strong the culture of revenge on the northwest frontiers mm -hmm. of Pakistan and in Afghanistan are. I mean, someone should explain to the senator what the problems are in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, let me ask you uh, two questions requiring brief answers. What, what could change things in Pakistan uh, toward a positive direction? Um. Well, I, you know, there's nothing that can be done immediately because these problems have accumulated now for several decades. But as I argue in my book, uh, non-stop, we need a modernization plan. Mm -hmm an education system for all, for everyone, health, shelter, food subsidies to stop malnutrition, just to give you five, but this can't be done overnight, I know that. The question is, will we ever get a government, civilian or military, that understands this has to be done? That is the only medium-term solution. There are no short-term solution. You can go and kill more people. That always appears, you know, it, it appeals to military minds. Let's go and kill more people. But the more people you kill, the more replace them. Mm -hmm. And you have to make a real structural shift inside that country. And that cannot be done without tackling the country's social structure. And, and you also think a, a regional solution is necessary that brings in the <coughs> regional actors to reach an agreement about Afghanistan, Afghanistan. yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think if the West was prepared to consider, the West, let's not uh, mince words, the United States was prepared to consider an exit strategy, that exit strategy, in my opinion, would have to entail asking regional powers like India, Pakistan, Iran and Russia, of which Iran and Russia are not U.S. favorites at the moment, but certainly have been in the past. I mean, without Iranian support, they couldn't have taken Iraq or Afghanistan. So they need to register this fact publicly. Now, were they to do this and say to these people, I mean, they, these countries would be prepared because they all have support there, to set up a national government in Afghanistan backed by these four powers who guarantee its stability for 10 years, make sure there's no civil war, and begin a program of social reconstruction. Mm -hmm. This country has been at war for 30 years now. It's Afghanistan. Yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah. It's a 30-year war. And instead of looking for an exit strategy, both political parties in this country want to expand the war into Pakistan. Mm -hmm. It's thoughtless. It's mindless. One final question then. You're a student of empire and of history. How do you see 
the U.S. What 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 is what accounts for its sort of lack of understanding uh, of the dynamics on the ground? Uh, is it that that uh, in the that in in later stages all empires become so myopic that that they can't see the realities, or is it, is it part of being an empire with great power that you don't? I think it's the latter. Yeah. I think you are so strong militarily that you feel you can do anything you want to do because there is no the next eight countries after you in military strength even were they to combine they couldn't do anything to you that is true but that imparts let's say a false consciousness to the imperial leadership which we witness in both republican and democratic parties at the present time uh, and they think they can get away with anything but you can't because there are other factors at play a the world is not as simple as it seems it can be conquered militarily second the way you are behaving is encouraging regional hegemons to behave in the same way who mm. can't this is what the russians have done this is what the indians could do or the chinese could do this is what the Brazilian could do in Latin America if they wish to saying well we're a big power we have military strength why don't we go and sort out this Colombian regime uh, which is a pro US regime why shouldn't we do it or Chavez you know anyone so it's a dangerous way to operate and I think what is the case without any doubt that the US is overstretched uh, its attempts to surround the Russians with uh, missile bases, its attempts now to do the Chinese, are, I think, in the medium term, not going to succeed. And so expanding the war into Pakistan, if you see it within that framework, is a sort of short-term measure which is going to create more problems than uh, solutions. And that is why it should not proceed any further. Well, uh, Tariq, I want to thank you very much. I want to show your book again, which I recommend to our audience, uh, and it, it's an important contribution uh, to uh, our understanding of a region uh, where uh, the, the U.S. has been a lurking presence and is becoming more uh, uh, involved in what may be a quagmire. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.